Good morning. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. From Genesis onward, Genesis 3 onward, there is an issue with sin. Sin separates people. It separates people from God. It separates people from each other. And it separates people from their best self. Sin separates, but forgiveness is the path to healing. It's the path to healing between God and man, and especially between people. Deep hurt separates and isolates people. And the goal of this separation in the mind of evil is to destroy. The Tin Boom family lived in Harlem outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, known to many Americans as, as Holland. Pretty much overnight, the Nazis invaded Belgium and the Netherlands and took over. And part of their operation was to identify and isolate and exterminate the Jews. The Tin Boom family were Christians, and they were committed to God and God's people. And they had a clock shop that's still there today in Harlem, the Tin Boom Clock Shop. And on the third floor, of the clock shop, they built a false wall out of bricks. It was a place where they could hide people behind there. They hid Jews of all ages as they were coming into Harlem and escaping out of out of the Netherlands to the United States or to England, someplace of freedom. This hiding place was eventually discovered, and Casper Ten Boom, Corey, Wilm, and Betsy were all thrown into a concentration camp. Casper Ten Boom died very quickly. But Betsy and Corey were taken to Ravensbrook, a concentration camp where her sister eventually died and where she herself was subject to horrible indignities. In spite of all those difficulties, all the horror of seeing others killed, abused, neglected, after the war, Corey was in a church in southern Germany in Munich, München. And there she was. She finished preaching at this church. And as she finished, she saw him, the former SS man who stood guard at the shower room in her processing center at Ravensbrook. He was the first of the actual jailers that she had seen. When she got there, and now she, he's the first that they had seen since the war was over. She thought of the mocking of men as the women had to strip in front of them and go to the showers, throwing the heap of clothes in a pile and walking to the showers. She remembers Betsy's pain-blanched face through this horrible 
humiliating situation. And this man, out of all the people, came up to her, beaming and bowing and saying to her, how grateful I am for your message, Fräulein, he said. To think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. He's speaking it with a thick German accent. His hand was thrust to shake into Corey's hand. And as he had preached, as she has preached so many times, the need to forgive, and she didn't want to move her hand toward his. Angry, vengeful thoughts broiled through me, she says, and I saw the sin of them. But Jesus Christ had died for this man, and was I going to ask for more? And Corey prays silently, Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me, help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. I was cold. And so I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened, she says, from my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. This is taken from the book, The Hiding Place, by Corey Ten Boom. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent. Not to put it too severely, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are unaware of his schemes. The message here is not only to forgive the offender, but to comfort him. Today in our world, forgiveness is often talked about. It's better to, in your mind, somehow to come to a place where you forgive the one who has abused you, the one who has hurt you. It's better for your own mental health. But this goes far, far beyond that not only to forgive the person who has hurt you, but to comfort them. It almost makes no sense. It seems impossible to give, forgive someone who's offended you, but not only to forgive them, but to go beyond that and comfort them. Boy, God, you're asking an awful lot. But see, that is the way 
for restoration. In our churches, we don't have conflicts. No, yes, we do. But what happens in the modern world? There is a conflict, there is a sin, and the people fly. They go to a different church. They go to the one down the street, over the hip valley and over the hill, and start all over. And then the same problem happens because no one wants to address the problem. No one wants to confront the sin. No one wants to forgive. And no one wants to restore. Because it's very difficult and painful. And you can't do it on your own. We like to do things we can do when we're in control. See, that's the thing that Corey Ten Boom found when she saw this SS officer at the church in Munich, that she had no control in and of her own emotions and strength to forgive this man. She had to rely on Christ at that moment to forgive. And if we're going to have whole churches, if we're going to have whole Christian communities, if we're going to have whole Christian friendships and Christian families, we need to learn to forgive and go beyond, as Paul says, to not only forgive, but comfort those who, are, who have offended. The attitude that prevails in our culture today is Karma will get it. In the end, God's justice will zap him. And you even hear people talking and that are Christians talking about karma. Karma's this, karma's that. Words you can't say in church. But the Christian message is forgiveness. If someone has spoken unkind word, spoken behind your back, someone who has violated your trust, forgiveness is the only way to restore. And it goes far beyond, and, and you know, forgiveness is a process. You begin to forgive, and you have to keep forgiving. Corey, in her mind, had assumed that she had forgiven this guy. She did mentally until she saw him and have the emotions flood her all over again. And that is how it is when someone hurts us. We try to avoid them. We try to stay away from them. We hate them, but we can't say that. We're trying to forgive them. But see, it, it requires something more than just the mental activity of deciding to forgive. Paul is going a whole lot farther, telling us we have to comfort the one, the erring brother or sister that it's our responsibility to go beyond forgiveness, to restore, to make right. This is true in family relationships, friendships, all relationships. People hurt and deceive each other. I wish that Christians were perfect but they're not, I'm not. And the only way to move forward together is to forgive and to restore. It's crucial because the goal is not just no hate, the goal is much bigger than that. 
It's reconciliation. It's restoration. It's the continuance of the community, of the family, of the relationship. And Satan is actively scheming against God's people. He wants to destroy individuals. He wants to destroy relationships. And he does it with lies, mistruths, misunderstandings. And there is no crime that justifies your hatred. Paul had a right to be angry when someone called him something, did something behind his back. Christ was beaten and he's hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His visit was painful. He's revealing a little bit more about it, that it caused grief. And it grieved you. But he's not mentioning the person's name. You notice that? It's We know about a bad situation, but he hasn't labeled the person like they would on Twitter or Facebook or at a church board meeting or at a group of friends meeting. They want to protect the other person. They love the other person in spite of the hurt, in spite of the pain. So it's just a matter between Paul and so-and-so. If one part suffers, every part suffers. We are a body. We're interconnected. There's a spiritual connection between family and friends and church and Bible study. Confronting someone with their sin is enough. Forgive and comfort. Reaffirm your love for him. So that Satan might not have a foothold. See, there is a need for confession. A lot of people, you know, tell me, God knows everything. He knows everything. Why do I need to pray and confess to God? Intellectually, you don't need to. Because God already knows. But there's something in confession there's something in verbalizing things to God that he wants from us. It changes the dynamics in the relationship. When we confess our sins to God and when we confess our sins to each other, therefore, in James 516, it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We don't want him to be, we don't want the one who victimized and we're forgiving to be overwhelmed with sorrow. Our human reaction is, oh, we want that guy to be overwhelmed with sorrow. He hurt me. But that's not Christian love. That's not the example that Christ is setting forth. We are to be lovers of our enemies. It sounds incredibly stupid, but that's the thing that Christ has called us to. He has called us to something that is impossible without his help. You can't emotionally forgive. You can't emotionally 
comfort the person who hurt you without his help. It just won't happen. Your emotions will kick in. You will lose control. You will make a fool out of yourself. Those are the choices we have in life. To either follow our own gut, which will take us to the wrong place. It might not even take us to forgiveness. But the idea of restoring that person and comforting them so that they're not destroyed. See, we're always thinking about ourselves. That is the core of Christian love, is that we think more about the other guy than we do about ourselves. And that is what Paul is getting at here. Thinking about the spiritual condition, the hurt, the sorrow, the brokenness of the offender. We need to confront things. We just can't avoid them. That's another thing our culture would like to do. Just avoid it. And it's not the biggest deal in the world. Just, just, just stop talking about it. Cover it up. It'll go away. But problems don't go away in churches, in families, or in friendships you don't deal with them, you don't forgive them, you don't bring restoration, the whole thing will die. The whole thing will die. And they die often. And we call some of these people church hoppers. And we have other people we call friend hoppers. And we have other people who are, who are family hoppers. They go from family to family, finding other relationships and never finding wholeness and reconciliation. But the goal must be reconciliation. The goal must be restoration. And love must be the the primary focus of our hearts. It's hard to act as if nothing had happened, to forgive someone, to restore someone. You don't want to do that. There's a gut feeling in our hearts. We'd like to put a mark on that person so everybody knows that this guy can't be trusted, that this person is deceitful. They lied to me. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you, Ephesians 4.32. Put on then God's chosen ones, holy beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. It's to be forgiven in everything, to comfort the person instead of only thinking about yourself. Because when you're hurt, and when you're angry, that's all you think about. It consumes your life. The anger that you have to that person who said this to me, who did this to me. And then the process of forgiveness but the idea of restoring that relationship, that's a hard one. See, there is no Christianity without forgiveness. Christianity 
is all about God sending Christ to forgive us our sins, and he wants us to be the source of forgiveness in the relationships we have with others. It's a trap for us to think that forgiveness, mentally taking care of something, is enough. It doesn't mean you have to spend the rest of your life with the person, but you have to restore after there's forgiveness. You will know, one person says, that forgiveness has begun when you recall those who hurt you and you feel power to wish them well, according to Lewis Smedes. Forgiveness is an act of will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Another quote by Corey Ten Boom. And you know when you're ex you've experienced grace and you feel like you've been forgiven, you're a lot more forgiving to other people. You're a lot more gracious to others. Rick Warren. Because forgiveness is like this. A room can be dank because you have closed the windows and you've closed the curtains. But the sun is shining outside and the air is fresh outside. In order to get that fresh air, you must get up, open the window and draw the curtain apart and let it in. Desmond Tutu. Man has two spiritual needs. One is for forgiveness, and the other is for goodness, by Billy Graham. Norman Cousins said, life is an adventure in forgiveness. Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Forgiveness is not a feeling it's a decision we must make because we want to do the right thing before God. It's a quality decision that won't be easy, and it may take time to get through the process depending on the severity of the offense. Joyce Meyer. Forgiveness is the answer to the child's dream of a miracle by which what is broken is made whole again. What is spoiled is made clean again. Dag Hammarskjöld. We think that forgiveness is weakness, but it's absolutely not. It takes a very strong person to forgive. No, it takes a very strong God working in and through an individual. Mark Twain said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. It's one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself to forgive. Forgive everybody, Maya Angelou. Forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Lewis Smedes. David sinned. He sinned against God. He sinned against his nation. He sinned against his wife. And he wrote a prayer which I recommend to each of you to read and think through seriously. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 1 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. See, he knows it and he repents it. He changes his mind. 
and against you only have I sinned. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and a steadfast spirit within me. See, forgiveness becomes a spiritual battle. And it's the most important spiritual battle that you'll ever face. If Christ has really forgiven you, you will battle on and battle on to forgive the people who have desperately hurt you, whether they are Christians or non-Christians. The hurt, the pain, and it's, it's even more painful when it's somebody who should be loving you. Some of you are familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, a book by John Bunyan. He wrote in prison. It is a allegory. The main character in Pilgrim's Progress is a man named Christian, because he is a and the obstacles and challenges that he goes through. And it's a way for him to communicate God's amazing grace. And he, he's trying to communicate the sufficiency and the unbounding amount of God's grace. And as Christian is on his way to the eternal city, heaven, the interpreter leads him. The interpreter is someone who's helping him guide him through this journey to the eternal city. And it leads him to a place where there is a fire burning against a wall. So you see this big wall, and there is a fire coming out of this wall. And there is someone there who is continually throwing water on this fire, trying to put it out while the fire just burns higher and hotter. When Christian asks the meaning of what he sees, the interpreter leads him around to the other side of the wall where he sees a man with a vessel, a bottle, a container of oil in his hand, which he is continually throwing into the fire. The interpreter explains, this is Christ who continually, with the oil of his grace, maintains the work already begun in the heart, by the means of which, notwithstanding, what the evil devil can do, the souls his people prove gracious still. See, the devil is throwing water on the burning grace of that God and Christ is providing, and it's never put out because the oil of God's grace overwhelms. And this fire, this burning, it's not destruction, but it's the presence and the power of God's grace coming out. God wants to forgive. He wants to use you to forgive the people in your life who've hurt you, and he wants you to comfort them, not just forgive them and forget them, but to forgive them and comfort them and restore them. And you say, I can't. It's just not in me. And remember what Corey Ten Boom said, Jesus I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened from the shoulder to my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass through me. While well, I, in my heart, sprang a love for this stranger that overwhelmed me. See, what you can't do, God can. And the oil of his grace, there's no shortage of it. It keeps coming out. 
evil will want to put that fire out. But the burning power, the transforming power of forgiveness and restoration is what God wants for your life. He wants for his people's life. And the responsibility starts with you. Who has hurt you? Who do you need to forgive? And, and do more than just forgive and move on. He wants you to forgive and comfort them, to restore them, to bring them closer to Christ. And you say, I can't do it. We can't love our enemies in our own strength. We can't forgive our enemies in our own strength. It takes the power of Christ, the grace of Christ, working in and through our lives for this change to happen. Ask him, Jesus, I cannot. Give me your forgiveness. Give me your grace. Give me your love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with brokenness. Brokenness from the pain of being hurt and the brokenness of unknowingly and sometimes unwillingly and sometimes willingly hurting others. And Lord, we ask you that we might have restoration in our churches, in our relationships, in our families. Help us to confess our sins to one another and trust on God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness to fill our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.